welcome everyone. Uh, welcome to a a new kind of article, a new kind of content uh, uh, approach here on Kids' platform. A, a, a new guest uh, joining us today. Uh, this has been a, this can be a little bit of a new, uh, I guess, experiment for us. Hopefully, a new series. If you like, then give us good feedback around it. We're talking today around uh, reaching more high net worth prospects, which I know most advisors at some point want to figure out. How do I move a little further up market? It's nice to get paid a little bit more for your time and advice from people who have the financial wherewithal to be able to pay us a little bit more for our time and advice. And so my my guest today is John Bowen. So many advisors know John is CEO and founder of CEG Worldwide, which has taught and trained advisors around marketing into uh, high net worth clientele for many years now. More recently, uh, uh, CEG bought Spectrum Group, which was an, a market research firm around how consumers engage with advisors. Now CEG Insights, putting out what I think is some really interesting data, dad, because you know I love data, some really interesting data around what do affluent consumers actually care about when they're looking at advisors and trying to pick advisors? And I, so I thought like, what a fun way to experiment this to say, maybe we could just put some data on a screen and talk about some interesting numbers. So that that's basically our goal and lineup today. And just want to welcome John, welcome to uh, the Kitsis platform and getting to nerd out with us a little bit on research data. Well, Michael, you and I, uh, first of all, appreciate the opportunity to uh, share the nerding experience with you. We both have for our whole careers loved empirical research and I've done it for many, many years, both as an advisor, building a practice of a couple billion dollars. And then now the last 20 years doing uh, coaching and you know, there's just so many insights. And you know, the problem I always think about when I was an advisor that we're always in this entrepreneurial fog. We're trying to figure it out. You're providing some great, yep. you know, you got a great lighthouse. You're pointing the path. But the more detail we can have, I mean, the more yes. powerful it is. And, and um, you know, there's an opportunity to do well by doing well. So I'm I'm excited to be here today. So, so I think before we get in, because we're we're gonna get pretty nerdy pretty soon here. Like there are going to be screen shares with charts. I promise no one would there won't actually be any Excel charts. John has made them in a very nice polished chart. So we're not gonna look directly at spreadsheets. Like we're we're gonna get nerdy on that in a moment. But John, maybe just before we kick off for folks who are maybe know our, our kids' platform but are a little bit newer to you, can you give us a little bit more perspective? I think particularly around CEG insights and the study that you've done and then we'll we'll start looking at yeah the, you can go to the website uh cg insights and I'll, I'll push a button and just put it up on screen it's as right. you would expect cg insights uh and it is uh dot com and this is really where we brought together the research that CG worldwide our coaching organization has been doing a couple of studies every year for the last 20 years and merged it with Spectrum, who world-class, as you were saying, Michael, world-class on really studying the affluent. And we said, why don't we go ahead and continue those studies on the affluent? And, and we do four major segments, um, all the way up to about 25 million of investable okay. uh, that we do. And, and we're going to talk about one of them today that I just think is so eye-opening for everyone. Yeah. And then we also do, we studied the very high end, uh, not family office, but all the way up to family office from 25 million and above. And we just completed, uh, we did a strategic partnership with some of you know, strategic coach, Dan Sullivan. Yep. Dan and I did a study of a little over 2,000 entrepreneurs. So, I mean, we're we're really diving in all this. There's eight studies each year for our corporate clients. But, you know, Michael, part of working together, you know, here on this, uh, we're going to make available to all your uh, audience, a uh, report, we call them play to win on what we're going to talk about today. You know, the, I always call it the wealth management gap. There's a difference between, you know, what the affluent want and what they perceive they're receiving. And okay. this is going to keep us what? busy for this. That's an interesting way to frame the gap. So like, and I know we'll get more into this in a moment, but like, we're not necessarily talking about the gap between what, in, what wealthy investors want and what advisors are offering more along the lines of what 
what affluent investors want and what they perceive they're getting, which has yeah, some which is, around you know, there's, where that there's a difference that. because their perception may not be reality. It may not be oh. the advisor's reality, but you know, when we get into the data and we're, we're going to share with you uh, the ability and you know, I'll just put it up. You can go to www.cgwin.com uh, forward slash teaches and you can download the report. We're going to go and it has more than what Michael and I could talk about or geek out about today. But one of the biggest surprise is, you know, really advisors are telling us they're doing what clients want <laughs> and it's exactly. And then, but then when you ask the clients, they're not perceiving it. Now, I don't think anybody's lying, but there's a difference in realities that, you know, we're going to talk about today that represent an opportunity, not only for anybody who wants to move up market, there's a huge opportunity, but also for your own clients, it's kind of that offense defense type thing that, and, and particularly in today's world as technology is improving AI, you know, before Michael and I turned on the camera, we we're talking about AI and, you know, you've got to be able to add value, you know, average advisors, AI is going to take that very quickly. So we've got to think through how can we create more value for whoever we choose to work with. So, so in that vein, so I want to get more into the gap in in a moment, but I, I actually want to start the conversation because I know you have some interesting charts and data around how advisors just try to differentiate themselves to attract in the first place, right? Like we we can't get to the services gap between like delivery and experience until we just get to what are we even trying to offer to differentiate ourselves in the first place? So I'm wondering, maybe we can start there of, I know you have some data around how do advisors yeah, try to differentiate themselves? Yeah, let's just shoot that up, Michael. I mean, you know, this is one of the things we've got to be careful, everyone, about, you know, we all look the same. I got to tell you, I, I, I had a speaker come uh, to an event, uh, 200 top, our top clients. And this is a number of years ago, but he took pictures off LinkedIn of everybody. Yep. And for the guys, the only difference was whether they had a red tie or blue tie uh, type. They might be a little different now. You know, some will be without tie. The ladies weren't that much different. And, you know, so when we talk about, when Michael and I talk about different, whoops, let me hit the right button. When we talk about differentiating ourselves, it's really this here is um, we, we zero I'm in on financial what these, planning. What these and, numbers say. So 58% of us differentiate by the fact that we offer financial planning, frankly, and that's advisors at large. Uh, you are, our Kitsis readership, that's probably an even higher percentage. 55% of us are differentiating on the level of our customer service, 54% by our comprehensiveness. So very like there there are there are two things that strike me about this just looking at it. The the first is like so basically we're all saying we provide financial planning and have great service, which starts to feel not very differentiated cuz we're kind of all saying it. Yeah. And B like literally we're all we're all saying it like 55% of us are saying we've got better than average service. 55% of us can't be above average. Well, it's so funny because when we start thinking of how we differentiate ourselves, you know, imagine you go into any kind of business and they say, we differentiate ourselves by giving good service. I mean, that's kind of, that's table stakes. Okay, I'm coming to you as a financial advisor. You do financial money, table stakes. I have comprehensive service. Oh, I would hope so. I think. These are not, oh, and I've been in it for a long time. Yeah. Okay, great. Uh, these are not powerful marketing differentiators at all. So so then what is, because I know you've, you've done some work of like the advisors who are actually getting a little bit more traction, like what are they offering that's actually different when we start looking rest. at it, and we're going to get into it when we see the drivers, but they're looking, what people want are exclusive services. And, you know, depending on the market, and we're surveying a wide range, long-term planning, obviously, that's what, not, for the ultra-wealthy, that's not going to be. What What is long-term planning in this context? My, my brain goes to long-term care insurance. I don't think that's what we're talking no, about. No, we're talking, we're, people... One of the things we're we're starting to think about is longevity. And most of us like life. 
and we want to stick around longer. So okay. really planning through that longevity, wellness, uh, number one, on the personal concerns, there's usually two. Depending on the partners, they're within 1%. I care about my spouse more, their health, and then mine type thing. Sometimes okay. it flips, but they're always... You know, so this is a very like health, wellness, longevity kind of orientation. Yes. And then, you know, we start thinking of, you know, we care about families, you know, the family financial education. And, you know, as we continue down this, one of the things I, I want you to look at, and this is, you know, when we break it out in the report by generation too. So if you're in my group of baby boomers, yeah, quite honestly, socially responsible investing is not a big deal. If you're in the millennials, big deal. So you want to think through your audience, who you're going to do. What we're really seeing when we start going through all of these, though, is the people when we segment by income, what they're doing is they're providing advice beyond simply investing. And many of them are positioning as virtual family offices, you know, with technology today being able to provide like a single family experience, but virtually. What does that mean in the context of high net worth clients, like virtual family? I know our industry use. I feel like basically virtual family offices, we have comprehensive planning with great service and we can use Zoom. And so at a minimum, we define it as five things. You're going to help them make smart decisions about their money, you know, the investment okay. side. I do wealth. that. Uh, second is mitigating taxes. You're going to be very thoughtful on okay. mitigating taxes. The third thing is you're going to take care of their errors. You know, and this is whether with the exclusions and so on, they have to pay estate taxes or not. This is people are concerned that most families are dysfunctional. I don't know, Michael, your family. I, I do know mine. I know many others. You know, and there's taking care of the errors means more than just avoiding taxes. And then Asset Wait, protection. Taking care of the what? Air, air, heirs. You know, the uh, heirs, heirs, yeah, beneficiaries, heirs. Got it. Yeah. Okay. And then the uh, the asset protection side. One of the things is, okay. you know, you get wealthier. You know, there's nothing worse than going down. I go up very gracefully. That going down, not so good. Uh -huh. And then charitable. And then really what we're seeing most people doing the uh, virtual family office, <clears throat> excuse me, they go ahead and they understand this health and wellness. So they're including some kind of longevity, concierge relationship. Remember with right. virtual, you don't have to provide all the expertise, but you have to be kind of the franchise player, putting it all together for them, bringing these experts uh, together. But I'm, I'm struck by this list. So it's just sort of the like comprehensive advice, that's the starting point, but mo most of us do that. Taxes with the asterisk, so like these get a little more complex around the tax issues when you start adding several zeros to the uh, to the balance sheet. Take care of my heirs. So that's family that's financial good. education, that's intergenerational planning. That's like, how much money do I leave my kids and not ruin them? And how do I actually transfer it to them? Because only one wants to be in the business, the other doesn't. Well, like and and what was eye-opening, you know, on this nerding off stuff is how young they want you, to, they want, you to start talking to their kids, certainly before 26, but as teenagers, yep. Yep. and it's really important to them. And, you know, obviously many advisors are not doing that type. Uh, so they're very concerned about their, you know, the, the kids and their beneficiaries yep. that they have. So I feel like a lot of advisors will, will say like, sure, you know, we, we, we do some occasional workshops for, you know, children of clients, uh, you know, if Johnny wants to come in and open his first Roth IRA, I'll help him out. Like, uh, does that count? Or are you, are you like, if we're talking virtual family office, are you at some level beyond what we say we're doing when we're like, sure, I'll help your kids? Well, so one account? of the things that's really unique that we're finding in the most successful financial advisors, and we teach it in our coaching programs, is being able to have deep discoveries. So, one of the key things is in financial services, we can provide all kinds of expertise. I mean, Michael, your database, you've got so much, you've got all these experts. I have all these experts. We can do all amazing things. A novel idea is to ask your client what they're most concerned with and really understand you know, what their values are, 
what their goals are, what the, you know, really what are the important relationships before we even get into the asset liability side. And what we find in the virtual family office and we teach in our coaching programs, really identify what are no more than, I call it the vital few, the few things that you can do right away. Because when we, um, when I, I was a financial advisor, I, I can still remember when there was a time when I did 200 page, you know, gold letter, uh, oh, uh, yeah. letter books. Oh, and... we had like the, the punch device so we oh, can yeah. like <laughs> put the binding on. Yeah. Yeah, no, it, it is, uh, it, it is embarrassing, uh, to do it. And yeah, I had the privilege. I'm in Silicon Valley working with some of the top technology later on, entertainment and sports too. And, you know, and, and the reality, the second you deliver it, it's not correct. And, and you overwhelm people. And then really what the virtual family office is, it comes out of when we studied family offices in a recent study, we asked executive directors of family offices, uh, 199. We couldn't get that last one to get to 200, 199. And 95% of us, of them told us over the last five years, they had hired someone outside of their family office, single family office to do an audit, to make sure they were making smart decisions about their money. That was a stress test. Mm -hmm. This is what we see Everyone is concerned out there at every level of wealth. And this is where the biggest opportunity, if you actually deliver on this and help them in those areas that are concerned, and then on an ongoing basis, make sure they're not missing opportunities, make sure they're not making any strategic mistakes and have a process to continually improve. You know, clients want to work with you. That's a novel thing in our industry, unfortunately. So comprehensive advice, taxes, take care of my heirs, asset protection. And to me, yeah. now you start getting into realms that not a lot of us necessarily cover in as much depth as individual advisors. So I do have to ask here, like when you start talking about asset protection, like where am I supposed to be on this as an advisor versus like your attorney who's actually like drafting well, legal documents? Yeah, one of the things that... This is where you bring a professional network together because no one, no one can do all these areas. I mean, I don't care how smart you are; no one can do that. And even if you could, you're not going to be, you know, really at the the state of the art. I mean, the industry is changing so much in each of those areas. So we bring together experts to work in whatever market we're working on. Okay, but you know, and it, you, when we think of asset protection, oftentimes we think of offshore. Uh, you know, uh, companies that yeah. we're creating to protect. And, you know, the reality is oftentimes it's for many clients, it's just having an umbrella policy that's reasonable for their level of wealth. I mean, right. you know, having the right, and and this is one, uh, I know this statistic off the top of my head. When we ask affluent clients, we don't have it in this report, but would they like to receive a property casualty review from financial advisors? It's it's around 90%. That one I'm not sure of, but right. did you get it? Did you perceive you received it 6% habit? Okay, I can tell you there is no shortage of property casualty insurance guys and gals that will review it for you for free and give you a great diagnostic, but finding the right person that can add that value that's going to raise, that's going to allow you to create this virtual family office or this great wealth management experience uh, that's going to be pretty substantial. So, so I'm struck as we go down this list, like, look, comprehensive advice is sort of my classic financial planning and, and investment management core, taxes, heirs is an estate planning conversation, asset protection is a, like a risk management conversation. Charitable planning is a terrible conversation. Like, you know, the, those are classically five of the core domains that most of us do anyways. If I look at any of our website and say, like, do you do you do financial planning, investments, tax, estate, uh, insurance, risk management, and charitable? We all say yes. So may, maybe this gets to the gap that you were talking about, because uh, I know you have some, some data on this. Like, we say we do those things. And then affluent investors say they don't feel they're getting those things from us as advisors. Yeah, no, and it was really interesting. Let me walk through the data because it, it was shocking okay. to me. And I, I I actually got all the data. 
and then started using AI to just, how could I represent this and get the message across? And it created a heat map for me. And I think this is really eye-opening. So I want to share it. You know, when we look at this, what we find, you know, we looked at three levels. The first I'm going to look at is the service desired by wealthy investors. And this is, you know, if we're going to build a business, we should actually know what people want. Then we wanted to look at, is it, are they, what are the advisors providing? And then lastly, we wanted to see, do the wealthy, what percentage of the wealthy investors actually thought they got that experience? Okay. So as we go through, we look at this first row. It's a heat map. So things that are red, the brighter red, the more important it is. Uh, blue is it's uh, not happening. It's a lower percentage. So what and, do what do a wealthy want? Like investments, tax, estates, charitable, and a significant majority still want wealth protection, risk management. But it's at least a slightly lower. Yeah, it's percentage. a little lower. But you know these are all, and this is why we every individual is different. Obviously, it's not a hundred percent across the board. But I mean, for most advisors, depending on how, and the largest are still assets under management. It's kind of nice that the number one thing they want is help on the investment side. All right, so at least we'll like, we kind of do this on AUM model and then we add other things to it. Like not a bad place to anchor. It is literally the biggest box here, the most popular. Well, let's box. take it to the next level, Michael. The, okay. you know, what are advisors telling us they're doing? And okay. I go, you know, if we stopped here, this is like great. I mean, the, this actually lines up quite quite well. I mean, even like the relative heat map shading, like we're slightly less involved in the things that are slightly less demanded. We're leaning in the most of the thing that's got the highest demand. So I look at this, I'm like, okay, we're a tiny bit heavy on investments and a tiny bit light on estate, but there's really not much gap here. Yeah. And, and, and quite honestly, if we stopped here, we'd say, guys, you're doing a great job, but let's continue a little bit. So I said, let's take the data <laughs> you know, from these investors. How do they perceive? And yeah, you know, I, I mean, I was kind of even very surprised here that, you know, so, not everybody feels like they're getting investment advice, even though, you know, what? certainly we would have arguments between the advisors, yeah. but then we look at this whole blue area. So 85% of advisors say they're giving tax planning and 25% of wealthy clients believe they're getting it. Yeah. What a, you know, what a missed opportunity. Let's, as we go further to the right. Yeah. And when you look at this, and I want you to look at this, I would have every advisor looking at this and going, okay, if you believe you actually are delivering, let's take that tax advice, then you've got to get it clearly communicated. That's your fault. Your messaging isn't correct. Your packaging isn't correct and so on. Oh. On the other hand, what if you show this chart in your marketing to high net worth clients you want to work with and walk them through this and you're able to honestly say that you deliver everything that other advisors aren't doing? This is where it gets well, very, very compelling, Michael. Except the implication is we literally all say we're doing, I mean, at least 75% of advisors say they're doing all of these boxes. Yeah. No. Which I guess to me, it gets, gets back to your whole analogy of like the, the gap. But to me now it starts to connect the dots of like, look, we say estate planning because we look at their wills and trusts. And what they meant is I need you to train up my heirs to not get ruined by the money. Yeah, we and say it means we do different risk management because we different reviewed your people. insurance, but they want more asset protection conversations. We're not we're not doing the the right stuff with the high net worth lens. Well, and it's and the right stuff is you want to be careful. Like I could put together a checklist of all the different things in each of these areas, but this is a key where that's where I went back to that discovery. You've got to ask them what they want, what are the most important things for them, and start checking them off. And as you share with them that you're addressing it, that's where it takes off tremendously. So how are you asking it though? Because again, I feel like all of us are saying like, you know, do you want help with estate planning? Yes. Do you do you want help with uh, taxes? Yes. Like, great, I do that. But right, so clearly we still got a gap. So 
Yeah, and it's we call What's, it a deep discovery. But what we do, and you know, I mean, there's a we use mind mapping. You know, it's real simple, kind of in concept. But you, you think of the client or clients, and you start with questions on value. What's most important about your wealth to you? And then whoop, let me hit that. Put my whiteboard up. And then you start asking about what are the goals? What are you most proud of in the past? Where do you want to go from here? And then as we continue through that, we're going to ask about the most important relationships. And right. you know, one of the things, 18% are going to tell you they're pets. And this is, you know, you, you want to, um, yeah, I grew up in upstate New York shooting things. Um, my wife is an animal right person. You got to make sure that you get the difference in values. Then and only then do we go into assets, liability, that part. We're also going to ask, most people don't ask about advisors. And it's not just you know, financial advisors, but we're going to ask about their accountants and attorneys and so on. We're also going to ask, how do they want to work with us? What are the process? that they're, they're looking to do. And then lastly, what do they enjoy doing when they're not working? So we, you know, we have an interview guide going through all this, but notice these are all emotional. Right. And what we, our research is 84% want to connect with you emotionally first before uh, engaging you. So the, by asking these series of questions, you know, some people, some of the advisors told me, John, they're giving us breadcrumbs of what we can do. No, they're not giving you breadcrumbs. They're giving you the exact layout. And this is where, you know, it's not, if you ask anybody, just as you did, Michael, if, would you like to make smarter decisions about your money? Would you like to reduce your taxes? Would you like to be more Again, effective yeah, in like your state we, plan? We all do Everybody, these 100%. Yet you're saying we're not actually delivering, or at least clients don't feel that they're getting these things from us. Right. Cause it, people want, what people want is to live a best life beyond, you know, investing. And we call it an amazing life of significance. They, they, they want to take care of the people they love, the causes they care about, make a difference in the world. You and I are weird. The financial advisors weird. we're wired wrong. We actually love this stuff. Most people don't, they want the outcome. So right. what we have to get clear on what's the outcome then we can help them get to that. And everybody's going to have relatively different uh, importance on each of these. So then the other question I've got, you know, you sort of frame this like, hey, there's even a marketing thing to say, you know, all advisors say do say they do this, but most affluent investors say they're not getting it. We're really going to do it for you. And that there, there's a fun marketing angle around that. But I know you've got data as well around wh where you actually should be going to get affluent clients in the first place so can you share some of the data or and just like where are where are advisors actually getting the business when it comes to very affluent clients well the, the most common not surprisingly let's just put up the slide is referrals and when we look at referrals you know the referrals from clients uh from you know the top 20 clients it was 28.8 uh 35 point uh, eight. Uh, this is this is a big number. Um, uh, you know, you can get a lot of referrals, particularly if you ask along the way. So, so this is the percentage of the referrals I got. What was the source of the referral? Right. And the number one referral is always clients. Uh, and yeah, the, well, the, although I'm struck by this, that like it's it's only about a, a third, 30, 35 percent and change so like i i even read this chart sort of the the opposite way which is uh two-thirds of the for advisors growing with high net worth clients two-thirds of the referrals were not from clients well and and, and when we start going to best like if i went down to investment bankers and i did a sort on 25 million and above they were 40 percent hmm. okay that's a huge number so if you want to work in the upper market you should have build relationships there. Accountants. Right. Well, if you if if you want to get to people that are having a liquidity event with tens of millions of dollars, try working with the bankers who actually facilitate liquidity events for tens right. of millions of dollars. I mean, it's I mean, you like, know, I say it joking, but it makes sense. I mean, there there's a reason why wirehouses historically have uh have had a lot of success working with ultra high net worth clients. They have investment banking divisions. It's an internal referral. They're already there. 
Yeah. And it's, and, and many of them, you know, we have coaching clients at the wirehouse, the independent broker dealers, the RIAs, it's about evenly at one third each, you know, they, they even, most of the wirehouses now only work at the higher, you know, mid size firms and bigger. Yeah. So many of the advisors also work with the smaller investment bankers and a small investment banking transaction is typically under 50 million. So most advisors are okay with that type thing. Yeah. And I'll manage. Yeah, somehow with manage the little, with, with the, the little ones. Well, and, and yeah, and we, we're seeing advisors bringing in a couple hundred million a year by doing focusing on that of new assets type thing. So, you know, it, it, it's more work. It's more competitive, obviously. The the sweet spot for most advisors is just being really poorly served is a two to 10 million of investable assets. Yep. They're being poorly served. The 25 million and above, almost always, it's, it's pretty good talent at that level. Not always, right. but, you know, if you want to play at those various levels, you know, you just make a conscious decision. But it is... Yeah, the thing like, you know, we'll get asked, uh, one of the best markets to work with is business owners. Yep. Well, how do you meet business owners? Where are they hanging out? In their businesses. <laughs> you, know, yeah. I mean, you can't knock on the doors anymore type thing. So, you know, where do you find them? Well, through other professionals, we talked about accountants, attorneys, investment bankers, but also mastermind groups, CEO groups. Uh, association. So niche marketing, just really powerful as well. But the the one thing just, you know, putting this is don't ask for referrals, provide a service. I, I you know, for most advisors, the most common one we teach is a second opinion service for your top clients. You make available for the people they care about a second opinion. And when you go through That's a free and you offering do or you, like you charge for that, no, you do it for free. You take them through this discovery process and you can very quickly, you know, if you've got any, you know, you're a reasonably talented financial advisor, you're going to be able to provide value right away. You can see whether you want to take them as a client or not. If you're not going to take them as a client, you know, point them in the right direction. And this is really powerful. You know, if you're going to go higher, you do stress tests like the family, single family office type. So, so then last question I've got in, in that vein, like if if the, just trying to sync these together, like you talked earlier about, you know, the fun we can have marketing, like I actually do the things that other people say they do, but I'm going to really do it for you. Except most high net worth clients are finding advisors through referrals. Like what is the role of my marketing, my website? Like where does it show up at that point? Yeah, no, this is to me an extremely interesting one. Um, as we look at this and, you know, you know, right. how significant is website and, you know, most advisors think of this as a marketing brochure. And yep. when we start looking, and I want you to look at this here is uh, kind of the summary of the chart. Um, what we found that 10 to 24% of new business comes from websites for about a third of the advisors. When you think about that, that's a fairly significant. And then, but a quarter got 25 to 50% from their website and a tiny fraction who's very effective, 6.3% are getting more than half of the business. So it's a, website. it's a strong assist, but it's not the center, but it is a strong assist is the implication here. Well, and it's, you know, you've got to have a reason that they're going to the website. Uh, obviously, you know, if your your clients are local, SEO type things can be very powerful. But what we find most, you know, websites are brochure where when you start really creating content and you become the, you know, people have a choice. Today's world, you know, it used to be they can go to, you know, they go find an expert. Now, you know, I I, I just want to really bring up the AI part you know, they can ask questions of AI. Well, yeah. you have to, you can't be mediocre. You've got to be able to add value. And it's not only technical value. You know, Michael's going to do a good job helping you with the technical part, yep. but it's the relationship stuff as well. And this is where, you know, that's going to be the big differentiator by bringing this together. But you have to communicate that on the website as well. 
Very cool. Very cool. Well, appreciate the conversation, John, and and hopefully it's been interesting for for folks who are listening. So again, if if because uh, I know like we showed a lot of charts, you know, just it's hard to depending on what device you're looking on, it's hard to see charts sometimes. So for folks that want to go get more and just see more of the data, again, where do they go, John? So we can just go ahead and hit this link. All right. Uh, and Michael, will, I'm assuming you know, the team will make that available com. in a whole bunch of different ways that you can click. Okay. And when you do click, you're going to come to a landing page like this, put your name, you know, phone number, email and all that, and you can download uh, the report. And, and one of the things I want you to do is not just do the report uh, for yourself, but this is a great tool for your team. You know, as we're taking this through, have them help you. You know, this is the big part that Michael and I were talking about the heat map, but there's so much information on communication. How can you effectively communicate this? You know, what we focus on is how can you attract, convert, and retain high net worth clients so that you can make, and the way you do it is creating tremendous value for them. You know, this is what I love about this industry, Michael, is, you know, by doing well by others, you get to do well. Yeah, I think the challenge for a lot of us and just what's striking to me is the framework. I, you know, most advisors I know say, I try to provide tremendous value. I try to do well by my clients. I do this to help people, uh, but they don't have multimillionaires knocking on their door on, on a regular basis. To, to me, the the kind of the crystallization of the gap is that we can talk about these classic areas we do, financial planning, taxes, estate, insurance, charitable, but the version of this that shows up for very high net worth clients and how, what they care about and how it gets expressed for them is different. Risk management is not necessarily do I have the insurance, it's do I have the right LLC structures for my multiple homes? Am I? Uh, well, it may or may not be. I mean, okay. you know, and that's where, Fair enough. yeah. I mean, one of the things that's pretty surprising, most people don't need overly complicated structures. Now, if you're, right. you know, you're a real estate investor and you got all kinds of apartment buildings, having them in separate LLCs, having a holding company yep. or management company, all that stuff. There's some obvious things to do that we can get pretty technical. But the big part, you know, you're, you know, really the advisors who are hanging out with you, you leveraging this, who are hanging out with me, you don't, I, the big point I want to get, you don't have to be the expert. You have to be, uh, you're not the quarterback either. You're the general manager. I hate using sports analogies, but this is, I think well, really works. So a, lot, a lot of financial advice, like say they're financial quarterback. So yeah, no general manager, here, like make that you, distinction quarterback versus general manager. Yeah, we're not, we're not on the game. We're not playing my ability to pass for, you know, 50 yards is accurately is not good anymore. However, I can go out as a general manager and pick some really amazing franchise players mm. in each of these areas that we've been talking about okay. that can make a material difference in the market that I want to serve. And that's, people don't believe you have all that expertise, but when you start going ahead and you have these franchise players you're bringing together, and why would they want to work with you? The reason they want to work with you, they're not good at marketing to the high net worth either. Right. They, they're they looking for two things, the attorneys, the accountants, and so on. They're looking for, is there a way they can be deeper in the relationships with their clients and you can show them how, I mean, just got an email, you know, one of our coaching clients picked up largest client for him, a $40 million client. And it was through a strategic alliance. You build these professional networks. It's very powerful. Um, don't try to do everything at once, but try to build you know, this value so you can serve whatever market and don't try to serve all markets because, you know, if you're working with real estate developers and then you go do high tech entrepreneurs, very different, very different technical things. Awesome. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Sean, for joining us. Appreciate the conversation today. Well, I look forward to continuing it and let Michael know how much you value this research. Yes. By yes. downloading it. And more importantly, working with your team to put it into action. Yeah. Let's go so make let a difference. Let us know, together. put in comments, check out the link. And thank you very much, everyone. Have a good day.